with the release of Spider-Man Far From Home, there are now eight Spider-Man led films that have been put out over the last 20 years. But what a lot of people don't realize is that for the 20 years before Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man movie came out, countless directors and studios were trying to get a Spider-Man movie made. And then both Raimi's fourth Spider-Man film and Amazing Spider-Man 3 were very abruptly canceled. So today we're gonna look at what we knew and what happened to the eight Spider-Man movies that almost happened. So let's talk about it. Hi, my name is Sean and I love to talk about movies way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Tell me which of these potential films sounded the best and which ones sounded the worst. As I go into this, I'm specifically talking about the canceled Spider-Man led films, not the Spider-Man spin-offs like Aunt May the Movie or any of the potential Venoms that didn't happen over the last 20 years. If this video does well enough, a follow-up could be coming about those spin-offs. Also, if you want to read more about each of the projects I talk about inside of this video. I've got links down below in the description to articles about all of them. There's way more stuff than I could cover inside of this video. I also link to some videos from a channel called Cut Short that talks about canceled projects. And if you enjoyed this video, you would enjoy that channel as well. As I go through this, I'm basically trying to give you a chronology of the history of canceled Spider-Man movies. With that said, let's get started. First up, Spider-Man and the Incredible Hulk, the TV movie. For those of you too young to remember, in the late 70s, 70s and early 80s, there was a hit show called The Incredible Hulk starring Bill Bixby as David Banner. The show changed his name, I didn't make a mistake there. Around the same time, there was also a live action Spider-Man TV series, though it was far less successful and only lasted 13 episodes. So after both shows had ended, Bill Bixby and Nicholas Hammond, the star of the Spider-Man TV show, were talking on the phone and Bixby floated the idea to Nicholas Hammond of would he be interested in continuing his role as Spider-Man and Hammond was interested. A month later, Bixby called up Hammond to inform him he was putting together a Hulk and Spider-Man team-up movie. The two actors would star, Bixby would direct, and Hammond would even get a story credit. The first obstacle for a team-up movie was that Universal held the rights to the Hulk and Columbia controlled the rights to Spider-Man. If you're familiar with the history of the MCU, it's essentially the same story. Universal distributed the Incredible Hulk film and Sony or Columbia still holds the rights to Spider-Man and had to cut a deal with Disney for Spider-Man to appear in the MCU. But Lou Ferrigno was unavailable for filming because he was out of country shooting a Hercules movie and Universal was unwilling to wait for him to be available. So the film was canceled. Ferrigno has stated he was never contacted about appearing in the film and him and Hammond both speculate that they used him as an excuse to cancel the film. A few years later, however, three made-for-TV Hulk films were made that starred Bixby and Ferrigno. One featured Daredevil and another featured Thor. But unfortunately, Ferrigno's Hulk never got to meet the wall crawler. Next up is Roger Corman's Spider-Man. Around the same time as the potential TV movie with the Hulk, Orion Pictures had the theatrical rights for Spider-Man and hired legendary low-budget film producer Roger Corman to get the film made. In turn, Roger Corman hired Stan Lee himself to write the script. As you would imagine, Lee delivered a traditional take on Spider-Man with the origin story, Mary Jane, Uncle Ben, Aunt May, and Doc off as the villain. And as this was the 80s, they worked in a subplot about Spider-Man stopping a nuclear war starting between America and Russia. Eventually, Roger Corman's low-budget tendencies and Stan Lee's desire to make a big-budget blockbuster stalled production, and Orion let the rights to Spider-Man lapse and the project disappeared. But eventually, both Corman and Lee would kind of get their way. Ten years later, Roger Corman was allowed to make an extremely low-budget Fantastic Four film, which has never been been officially released. And of course, some 20 years later, Stan Lee finally got to see Spider-Man brought to the big screen in true blockbuster fashion. The third try was Spider-Man the movie from Canon, try number one. A few years later, in 1985, Canon Films licensed Spider-Man for just $225,000. This gave them until 1990 to create a Spider-Man movie. At the time, Canon was known for a series of low-budget action B-movies such as the Death Wish sequels, Missing in action and the American Ninja films. The American Ninja films being personal favorites from my childhood. Initially, they hired Toby Hooper to direct, who had previously made Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist. And then they got the creator of Outer Limits to write the script. From the beginning, it was pretty obvious that they had no idea who Spider-Man was or what he was about, as their film looked far more like a horror film than a superhero film. I don't think Menachem Golan particularly knew 
what Spider-Man was. Menachem's understanding was that it was a spider, man. The script revolved around evil Dr. Zork wanting to create an army of mutants and intentionally exposing Peter Parker to radiation and turning him into an eight-legged spider monster. Spider-Man was a person who turned into a spider, like, like a, a, a werewolf uh, turns into a wolf. Eight-armed hairy creature, and he, of course, is suicidal because he looks so awful. And Cannon became so excited about the project that they started to put out promotional ads in magazines before they'd even started filming. Stan Lee, however, was less excited about the project and eventually convinced them to make a film closer to the source material. So a new team of writers were brought in and Toby Hooper left the project and was replaced by director Joe Zito, who'd previously directed Friday the 13th, The Last Chapter in Missing in Action. After several rounds of script revisions, they crafted a more traditional Spider-Man story with Doc Ock as the villain. Only to streamline the story a bit, they made Doc Ock Peter's mentor and combined their origin stories a bit. And for some reason, and they gave Doc Ock the catchphrase, okie dokie. While never fully cast in the role, stuntman Scott Level was unofficially attached to the project for a long time. A number of promotional shots of Leva in the role were created. Zito later revealed he wanted to cast Bob Hoskins as Doc Ock. Once again, Cannon was so preemptively excited about the project that they created a teaser trailer for it before anyone had been cast. History's greatest experiment creates tomorrow's greatest superhero. Spider-Man, the movie, a live action spectacular directed by Joe Zito. Things started to unravel when Cannon decided to purchase the screen rights for both Superman and He-Man and the Masters of the Universe at the same time. The studio heads understood those characters a bit more and decided to make them the studio's priority, giving each a budget over 15 million. As a result, because they didn't have all the money in the world, they cut down Spider-Man's budget from about $20 million, which is pretty healthy, down to about seven. And after ha having put a year, year and a half of his life in it, Joe Zito just threw up his hands, I can't make that picture for $7 million. And this version of the film fell apart. This brings us to Canon Take Two, Albert Payan's Spider-Man the Movie. Albert Payan was brought in to have the script rewritten and to make the film for as cheap as possible. The main objective was to reduce costs. During the previous rendition of the film, there was a lot of discussion as to whether they should try and cast an A-lister as Spider-Man. Tom Cruise's name was actually tossed around quite a bit. But with the reduced budget, this stopped being a topic of discussion and it seemed far more likely that stuntman Scott Leva would play the part. During this time, many versions of the script were tossed around. Payan wanted the lizard as his villain, but discovered this might not be cost effective. Another version of the script had a Morbius-like vampire villain. For a while, Stan Lee was even cast as J. Jonah Jameson. In reflection, Scott Leva would note that every version of the script that they gave him was worse than the previous version of the script that they gave him. As time passed, Cannon's financial problems only grew. First off, they had to slash the budget for Superman 4 so heavily that they actually had to reuse special effects shots. Then both Superman 4 and Masters of the Universe underperformed at the box office and lost the studio money. Eventually, Cannon decided to pull the plug entirely on Spider-Man the movie. But the studio had already spent over a million dollars on costumes and sets for the project. So they tasked Albert Payan to construct a movie that it could utilize all the leftover stuff from Spider-Man the movie as well as a canceled Masters of the Universe 2. The resulting movie? Jean-Claude Van Damme's Cyborg. With the film's low budget and Van Damme's rising star, the film turned out to be a moneymaker for the troubled studio. With Pyan's Spider-Man film canceled, they failed to make a Spider-Man film by the year 1990 and that meant they lost the rights to the character. But something else interesting happened in the year 1990 related to the story. The original Captain America film was released in the United Kingdom, not America, and who directed it? One Albert Payan. For this project, he had a $10 million budget, and for obvious reasons, it gives us the best idea of just how good his Spider-Man movie would have been, which is to say, not very good. 
Which leads us to James Cameron's Spider-Man. With Canon losing the rights to Spider-Man, Carol Co. picked them up. I don't actually know if it's pronounced Carol Co. I've read it a thousand times, but I've never actually heard someone say it. Same with Albert Payan's name. Don't know how to pronounce that either. Unlike Canon, Carol Co. had recently had a string of big budget hits, including Arnold Schwarzenegger's Total Recall and James Cameron's Terminator 2, which I guess is also Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator 2. So after the wild success of Terminator 2, James Cameron was brought in to start work on his own version of Spider-Man. And in true Cameron fashion, he had some very interesting ideas for the film. First off, he cranked up the sexuality of the character and the comparisons between puberty and becoming Spider-Man. His story both has a sequence where Peter Parker wakes up in bed with white ooze coming out of his body, causing his sheets to stick to him as an allusion to something. And a sequence where Parker uses his new powers to spy on Mary Jane while she's changing and then they later have sex on top of a bridge. The movie's villains would have been Electro and Sandman, but eventually a complicated web of studio rights stalled the project from making any real progress. And then 21st Century, Carol Co. and Marvel Comics all declared bankruptcy in 1996. This effectively killed the project, but it left multiple studios fighting over who actually had the rights to Spider-Man. And here's where things get weird. After several rounds in court, Sony or Columbia essentially surrendered the rights to make a James Bond film unaffiliated with the current franchise in order to secure the rights to making a Spider-Man movie. This led to Sony's search for their director. Prior to hiring Sam Raimi, Sony took pitches from a whole bunch of other A-list or up-and-coming directors, including David Fincher's Spider-Man. Anyone familiar with David Fincher's filmography knows that there's a tendency to drift towards the dark and his version of Spider-Man was going to be no different. First off, he didn't want to do an origin story, so he planned to do a 10 minute long single shot opening credit sequence in the style of a music video, which would cover all the important details. Second, he wasn't interested in exploring teenage Peter Parker, but was interested in looking at a guy who settled into being a freak. Thus far, that's different, but it's not dark. Third, he wanted Green Goblin to kill Gwen Stacy in the first movie by adapting the night Gwen Stacy died for the screen. None of that is inherently a problem, but he later admitted, I'm not interested in doing a superhero. I just couldn't shoot somebody being bitten by a radioactive spider. I just couldn't sleep knowing I'd done that. So what happened? According to him, I went in and told them what I might be interested in doing, and they hated it. Around the same time, they had Roland Emmerich, Tony Scott, Ang Lee, Christopher Columbus, and M. Night Shyamalan come in and pitch their ideas for this project. Eventually, Sam Raimi was hired to direct Sony's Spider-Man, and he went on to direct a trilogy of films. But he started work on a fourth film. That brings us to Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4. After a trilogy of highly profitable films, Raimi started work on continuing his franchise. Multiple screenwriters were brought in to work on three new films. One screenwriter worked on Spider-Man 4, while James Vanderbilt worked on 5 and 6, which potentially would have been one continuous story shot back to back. Though at the time, it was unclear if Raimi and his actors would return for 5 and 6. If not, these scripts were intended to lay the foundation for a reboot. Initially, Raimi had discussed wanting to have Dr. Connors turn into the lizard in part four, but eventually they settled on having the Vulture and Felicia Hardy, who may have been Black Cat or Vultress, as the two main villains with John Malkovich and Anne Hathaway in the roles. Likewise, there were plans and storyboards of Bruce Campbell as Mysterio for the intro to the film. Eventually, tension started to form behind the scenes because so Sony wanted the movie by a specific release date, but Sam Raimi's highest priority was making a movie that he was proud of, and reportedly he hated every version of the script that was turned in. Years later, Raimi would eventually tell Vulture, the media outlet, not the imaginary villain, I was very unhappy with Spider-Man 3, and I wanted to make Spider-Man 4 to end on a very high note and the best Spider-Man of them all. But I couldn't get the script together in time due to my own failings, and I said to Sony, I don't want to make a movie that is less than great, so I think we shouldn't make this picture and go ahead with your reboot, which you're planning anyway. So Sony officially canceled Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4 and moved ahead with James Vanderbilt's story, which became Mark Webb's The Amazing Spider-Man. As of 2013, Raimi hadn't seen Mark Webb's Spider-Man stating, 
I didn't see the Spider-Man reboot. I know Mark Webb is a great director. I just don't want to go to my girlfriend's wedding with all due respect. I just love her too much. I just have to wait. It would be hard to see her with someone else. Speaking of the amazing Spider-Man, that brings us to our final canceled Spider-Man film, The Amazing Spider-Man 3. Prior to the release of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Sony had hoped that the film would help launch their own Spider-Man shared universe. So in 2013, they preemptively announced Amazing Spider-Man 3 and 4 for 2016 and 2018, and they hired screenwriters to start putting together scripts for the Sinister Six, Venom, and Black Cat. There were also rumors of a Spider-Man 2099 film as well as Aunt May the movie, hence this amazing shirt that you could pick up at the link down below in the description. We don't know much about what the film would have been about, but some of what's been claimed sounds pretty bizarre. Peter Parker would have been recovering from the death of Gwen Stacy, and Norman Osborn, played by Chris Cooper, was supposed to return. Likewise, Dane DeHaan would have returned as Harry Osborn, the Green Goblin, and Paul Giamatti would have returned as Rhino. And Shailene Woodley probably would have appeared as Mary Jane. If you're unaware, she was cast and shot scenes for the amazing Spider-Man 2 as Mary Jane, but they were cut in the editing process as people thought it was a little bit weird to give Peter Parker a new love interest in that context. Where things start to get really weird is that according to Dennis Leary, his character was supposed to return in part three as a proposed plot line would have involved Peter Parker gaining the ability to bring loved ones back from the dead. Part of the discussion was that possibly in three, there was this idea at one point that uh, Spider-Man would be able to take this formula and regenerate the people in his life that had died. But even prior to the release of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, there started to be signs that Sony's plans for a shared universe weren't likely to happen. Before the release of 2, both Andrew Garfield and Mark Webb indicated they were interested in a third film, but not a fourth. And then when Amazing Spider-Man 2 was released, critics and fans both were largely unhappy with the film, and it fell far below studio expectations at the box office. Around the same time, Sony the company as a whole was facing financial troubles, so The Amazing Spider-Man 3 was delayed until 2018 and Part 4 was postponed indefinitely. Then in 2014, Sony started looking for alternative ways to use Spider-Man, including partnering up with Marvel Studios to have Spider-Man join the Marvel Cinematic Universe. After months of back and forth, an arrangement was made, a new Spider-Man would appear in Captain America Civil War, and Mark Webb Amazing Spider-Man 3 was officially dead along with Sony's Spider-Man shared universe. In just a second, I'm going to tell you which ones of these films I would have loved to have seen and which ones sounded terrible to me. But before I do that, go ahead and tell me down below in the comment section which ones of these sounded the best to you and which ones sounded terrible to you. Also, let me know, do you want me to create more videos like this? And if you enjoy this video, check out this playlist up above with all of my rankings of the Spider-Man films. If you've enjoyed this video, there's probably something up there that you'll enjoy. For me personally, the Roger Corman, Toby Hooper, Albert Pye, and Joe Zito versions of Spider-Man all sound pretty terrible, especially either in light of the types of films that they were making or what the studio was doing at those times. I just don't think they would have made a quality film. Likewise, the made-for-TV movie with the Hulk, I'm sure I would have treated it the same way I'd treat the other made-for-TV Hulk films, which is to say, it's interesting that they exist, but they're not all that good or watchable. James Cameron and David Fincher's vision of the character don't sound like they'd be particularly satisfying Spider-Man films, but they might have been interesting and possibly great films on their own terms. And honestly, I wouldn't have been terribly excited for a third Spider-Man film from Mark Webb. My favorite thing about his first two films was the relationship between Peter and Gwen, and obviously that couldn't continue in the third film, and it just seems like they'd kind of written themselves into an unpleasant corner. But out of all these films, the one that I think really could have been a great Spider-Man film was Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4. He seems very self-aware of the mistakes he made going into and executing Spider-Man 3, and it seems like he really wanted to make a great film and spend the time to do it right. And if the studio had given him the freedom as well as the time to make the film he wanted, I really do think he would have ended things on a great note. How about you? Tell me which ones of these you would have loved to have seen and which ones sound totally unwatchable. Also, let me know if you'd like me to create more content like this. I've already gotten notes about Spider-Man spin-offs, Batman, Superman movies. I've got more ideas if you guys want it. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.